Well, good evening and welcome to the last of three panel discussions with artists featured in this year's Florida Prize in Contemporary Art. I'm David Madison, I'm the museum's Associate Curator of Education and Outreach. Unfortunately, our planned moderator for this evening is not able to join us. And so I am going to be serving as your moderator this evening. Um, regretfully, artist Marielle Plaisir is also unable to join us, and, um, but I am joined by three amazing artists featured in this year's exhibition, uh, Trey Buscarin, Sean Miller, and Anastasia Semonglova. Um, I've added their formal bios for um, all of you into the participant chat to download. Now, before I ask each of them to introduce themselves, just a quick note about the features of our Zoom meeting space. So the participant chat is going to be the best place to make some informal comments. We love to hear from you along the way. Uh, please say hello. Please tell us where you are watching from. Um, just we, again, love to hear from you. And then the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, that's the best place to add a more formal question. Um, so questions for our panelists. I will be monitoring that throughout the evening and I hope to address all of your questions by the end of tonight's program. Now I'm gonna begin by asking each of our artists a bit more about their practice. We're gonna take a look at a few slides um, of the works that were included in this year's exhibition, which sadly has closed, um, but we'll get this kind of last hurrah, this last exciting moment to revisit the Florida Prize in Contemporary Art 2021. Um, after that, we'll go into a group conversation. I have a few questions for our artists, and then we're gonna close out by taking a look at the questions that you have, the audience, for them. Um, and then just one last note, it is the middle of storm season here in Central Florida, in Florida, all over. Um, so please be forgiving if we have some technical issues, it might be the result of some stormy weather out there. Um, so I, I wanna start off with Anastasia, actually. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Anastasia, are you there? Yes, hi. Hi. Um, so I'm going to share some images from this year's Florida Prize, and I'm just going to ask you to share a bit more um, about the works that you included in this year's show and your practice overall. So let's take a look. Um, so yeah, just take us through or maybe share a little bit more. Um, yeah, so what you're seeing is um, essentially photography printed on different materials. Um, these images are from my series called Flood Zone, and the, the title I think is telling. Um, I'm based in Miami, um, and these are um, sort of observations of my experiences here in the past five years now. Um, the project, oh, there it is, mm -hmm. so nicely installed. <laughs> um, so the colors on the wall are meant to replicate a rather kaleidoscopic environment um, of a highly sort of developed um, and intensely marketed city like Miami, uh, and by extension, um, many other coastal cities in South Florida, um, which we know are located in major flood zones and are very vulnerable to um, changing climate. So images yeah, the like one, this. Yeah. The one on the left is uh, that gator um, that became a cover of my book. Um, I'll show it to you once we're back to my video. And then yeah. the one on the right is actually from a hurricane shelter and it's a it's a facade of a building in South Beach. Oh wow. And then these two I really loved. And we we spent a lot of time talking about these images um because they're very like ironic in terms of the juxtaposition sort of that comes about in terms of the way you've composed these images like the the wave pool oh absolutely um, yeah right yeah. yeah definitely there's irony there's sort of this like dark humor throughout the entire project and i didn't want to approach the the, the theme you know climate change from yeah. a sort of cliched kind of stereotypical perspective, you know, um, photography is tricky like that, 
right? Because it's it's the most realistic looking image. Um, and mine are these sort of documentary style images, um, even though uh, none of them are staged, right? But what is what is truth anyways? And so, yeah, I, yeah my work kind of deals with that question too. So what you see on the left is a photograph of a billboard. Um, and of course, if any of you have been to Miami, you've seen how the city is really sort of permeated with those images of like even more perfect uh, Miami, uh, of Miami in construction, and there's perpetual development happening everywhere. So this is one of those um, luxury condominiums um, that is growing up in Sunny Isles. Um, and there are so many of those billboards around. I think construction sites are mandated um, to cover up um, you know, their, their territory um, for, for dust, but of course they use it to further advertise their new developments. And the one on the right is just a, a sort of water printed car shade, which um, I thought was a good metaphor <laughs> for for things to come so it's 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 sort of like playful take at the same time i didn't want to you know further sort of desensitize my audience with some sort of dramatic um you know there's plenty of drama happening around and and catastrophes well we saw that this week right i mean the un's yeah. report about climate change was drastic and and the images kind of coming out of the greek isles of uh, that kind of striking image that's been on every front page of a woman or photograph of a woman like having to flee um, that island in Greece because of the wildfires, that's, that's yeah. crazy. And it is, it's those, those disastrous kind of images that then become the face of climate change and your work operates in a much more subtle way, a more poetic way. Um, yeah, yeah, that I, was I, cool. Yeah, I, and so I hear you and you know, what is truth, right? What are, we live in this kind of post-truth paradigm but these these images, I know they're not staged, but can you talk a little bit about how, when you know, when you see an image, like what is your process a little bit um, in terms of recognizing these moments or, or when you know you need to take a photograph, like what is the impetus or the impulse or, or how you go about that process maybe? Yeah, great question. It's very intuitive uh, with photography, the kind of photography that I do that's very still, um, and mm -hmm. it's sort of more influenced by painting and architecture rather than photography. Uh, my, my degree is actually in, in architecture. And then I added um, sort of interdisciplinary lens-based practice later. So I see spatially, you know, space mm -hmm. is a great concern to me and environment. Um, so I studied environmental design. And then uh, painting, so I painted for years, um, I came into photography sort of way later, only really mm. in Miami, I started doing observational photography. Um, after years of studio practice, um, it, it seemed like the most fitting medium for what I mm. wanted to express. And the city is already this sort of um, life-size collage Mm -hmm. to where I could splice images without having to actually cut and paste them, um, if that makes sense. It's already- No, absolutely, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're kind of flat. There's a certain flatness to uh, my images uh, on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, I just started uh, sort of reminiscing about that, but I, I worked as a, as a shop window decorator for a couple of years in college. And I think it influenced my sense of composition more than college actually did. <laughs> <laughs> and that's interesting. It's always the informal learning opportunities yeah. that really shape us. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there is this level of like spontaneity in, in the humor, in the moments where, which you're dealing with such a serious topic. So I, I appreciate that, right? I appreciate um, the, those, those, those moments almost of levity too um, within the work, but uh, it's still getting at kind of an austere um, moment. And I, I know you wanted to share a little bit about the book too, which is gorgeous. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So the gator made it onto the cover of the book and it's, it's called Flood Zone <laughs> right there. And it's, um, that's sort of the most complete version of the project right now. Um, and it was published in Germany in 2019. 
Um, and it includes images that were not included in this exhibition, yeah, exactly. but it's the full catalog, right? Yeah, it's over 80 photographs, you know, so there are like some large ones. Um, it's all kinds. And it actually includes not just South Florida, but also Louisiana and Georgia and South Carolina. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Anastasia. We're gonna, um, I'm gonna move on actually to Sean's work next. Sean, do you wanna join us? Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm gonna share some images from the exhibition. Um, but I was saying earlier that I just loved watching visitors interact with your work. Um, so here, let me show these. Um, because these are art objects that really asked us to play, asked us to, to interact and engage physically with them. Um, and so what was so fascinating to me was to see visitors spend a great deal of time, right? Spend time um, kind of not just looking, but engaging um, with some of these, the, the content that you had on display in these, especially these drifting cabinets. So do you wanna just share a little bit more about your practice, about the works that you included in this show? Sure. The, the first image with the bicycles in the foreground and the cabinets in the background, those are two different projects. One's called Ecological Cycles and the other is Drifting Cabinets Behind It. And both of those projects, the, the cycles kind of came first and then the cabinets developed um, out of a project that I did with um, Brandon Ballinger called uh, Crude Life, which was, um, and Prasanta Chakparti, who are both, um, Brandon's doing his post, um, postdoc at um, LSU and he's a really great artist who has a really extensive practice that deals with activism and ecology. And my background is a, a, lot, a lot is dealing with um, um, experimental exhibition techniques and interventionist art and also curation. Um, I come out of this background where um, when I got out of school, I started an alternative space that's still running in Seattle called Soil with a number of other people. So it was a collective effort. And so that's a big part of, I, I think this whole exhibition is, um, it's not just me, it's like a group of scientists and, and artists that are participating together to make, make these things happen. And um, the Drifting Cabinets project, um, originally um, when we first started it with Brandon, it was Crude Life, and those uh, trunks mainly toured throughout on a NAFKE grant, um, toured throughout uh, Louisiana and at the National Academy of Sciences in California, we took it out there for an exhibition. And then when those when that wrapped up, I used some of the proceeds from the grant to just um, make a doubles for the cabinets. So we wouldn't have to take them back and forth between Florida because both the, the full title of the, of the piece is Drifting Cabinets, a curious collection of portable Gulf biodiversity. Um, so it's each of the cabinets represents a different um, part of kind of Gulf biodiversity. These two that are on screen now are um, amphib the amphibian trunk and the reptile trunk. And so they include, um, they're kind of constructed with um, wood that is either from trees that have been felled uh, during um, the hurricanes or, or, and the watercolor illustrations that I do um, that are on the interior of the Cuban tree frog and um, an indigo snake and an Eastern diamondback uh, rattlesnake uh, on the other one are done with water from hurricanes or water that I get from the Gulf of Mexico. So the idea is that the trunks embody the Gulf itself. They're trunks that have been repurposed. They're used trunks that get retrofitted with this wood um, from architecture, tree damage from hurricanes. So it kind of becomes a, a, a symptom or an outcome of uh, climate change and global warming. And um, so it becomes a part of the story. And, uh, and uh, so all the specimens are provided from different um, uh, museums or scientists um, that are working um, within the Gulf region that I keep in contact with and that sometimes attend the exhibitions and talk. And the whole idea is to get um, viewers in places that aren't museums, like right now it's showing in a museum, but it can open up at a brewery or a, school, a high school or anywhere, and uh, or a solstice festival in Louisiana or, or play, you know, places like that. And just people will come across it and then get drawn into conversation. So it's not as, mm -hmm. it's as much about 
the actual the kind of the sculptural presence of it and it being a collection as it is the the dialogue that's generated when scientists and artists and the public talk together and so uh, I, go ahead. yeah oh i would i just wanted to expand a little bit about that and and ask you i know these have toured to many different types of museums i, I didn't know about the breweries i'd love to hear a little bit more about that but the yeah. context in which these works are shown uh, how thoughtful are you in the planning stages of these in terms of where where you want to exhibit them and and maybe the ways that you expect visitors to engage uh, with those works in different contexts um i don't know i'm just kind of yeah. interested in that like i know you've shown them in natural history museums and during our last our tour of your section of the exhibition um we often talk about this is like a science center this is like a science museum but having it in an art museum shifts the meaning right. in some ways right exactly yeah the uh, i mean all that's a really good a good point i i think the 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 reason for being in so interested in presenting artwork like this is that is to is to be able to present it within within a gallery or museum structure, but also just in the public sphere. And um, when we like one of the things that I've brought up in, in conjunction with this work and the bicycles is uh, Charles Wilson Peel, one of the like first yeah. big U.S. Uh, museum uh, make a natural naturalists and activist and painter but also like really in, like starting natural history museums. Um, like he was he was known, uh, I was reading a book by Susan Stewart and she said that uh, there were accounts of him driving a old carriage through Maryland streets that was outfitted with uh, taxidermy uh, fawns and real horses and all sorts of different curiosities. And it, it said it, it was meant to excite a lot of curiosity along the road. And that that's like early interventionist performance mm -hmm. art done by a, a naturalist and an activist. You know, it's like that would have been included in his art practice if it yeah. was temporary time, it would have been just a, another venue for him showing. And I'm sure in, in his mind, he thought of it that way. So he's kind of like the the person that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of when I do this is, he saw a value in creating that curiosity in a public sector, as opposed to within the just a museum or gallery or natural history museum format. And I think it, putting the work into a state of play, where it's not um, where it's not explained, overly explained, but where it can be discussed by the public and artists and scientists and, let, mm. and musicians, um, that that is really interesting to me. And also. Uh, what's what's also really been uh, rewarding for me is also to have musicians there. And um, Marielle Placier was going to talk tonight. I was going to mention like when she's talking about um, diversity within the Caribbean and just all that. Um, that's a big part of 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 the idea. I think of biodiversity is we, you think of it as a scientific term, but it's actually it relates to the a culture. It's the diversity of life, right? So mm -hmm. part of it, like there's a there's a place within this exhibition where people can suggest a mixtape for the Gulf, where people can put songs and music that they're interested in, and musicians will play, uh, will sometimes choose from that list and play songs. So it's a kind of a, a a chance to reflect on the Gulf in a really multifaceted way, and like you'd mentioned earlier, an interdisciplinary way, mm -hmm. a multimodal learning opportunity, yes. right? So. Um, I think that's really fascinating. I would love to see it in a brewery. I think that the, the shift in the terms of ways that we would engage are, are yeah. so important to this work, are so important to, um, yeah, just the, the the benchmarks for learning. And you know, it was fascinating. So I had a younger visitor and an older an older woman get get into it about your work because I asked them, are cabinets of curiosity an effective form of learning? And the young man who, you know, has grown up in schools his entire life and, uh, said formal learning is the only way. And, and this woman said, no, you learn that these moments of informal learning, these kind of loose opportunities to be an intrinsically motivated learner, to engage with objects, to, to read the books that you have in these cabinets, that is the prolonged learning. Right? And so you gain an, a, a richer appreciation. And I thought that was just such an interesting conversation between these two uh, 
different generations <laughs> in terms right. of how we learn. And so um, I share that with you because I, I think there's something really there. I know there's something very effective about this strategy of display. Yeah. Um, that, so, I mean, the thing that the thing that's that's troublesome, I think, about cabinets, if I want to like push yeah. back against what I'm doing. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that um, there's two things that I'm hurtling uh, or trying to get around with this, and I I'm still haven't figured out the answer to it. And maybe I'm nitpicking, but I think there's there's this thing that people see death when they see cabinets of curiosity or displays like this. Yeah. And if they're already kind of afraid of nature, like if they're afraid of snakes and they're afraid of death, then these these types of displays immediately become problematic. And, but mm -hmm. the the idea is like when you're a child and you're out in the world and you see a dead bird that's fallen out of a tree, you take the opportunity to look at that, even though it kind of upsets you because you, it's sitting still and you can look at it. And that's mm -hmm. the whole thing with this is like, it's all this stuff that's sitting still for you to look through and really be curious about and wonder about. And you're right, it is a different kind of learning or approach to nature, but it's something mm -hmm. that I think art and science can work together uh, endlessly. I mean, the, the the link between art and science in Cabinets of Curiosity and and uh, Wunderkammers before them um, were uh, there was a there was a more uh, attached uh, attachment between those two disciplines, and mm -hmm. it's, it kind of went away during modernism, like during the uh, 19th and 20th century, a little bit. The surrealists held on to it, but but now I think we're at an opportunity after after postmodernism and that to to really like form these uh, interests in interdisciplinary learning and, uh, and rediscover those possibilities. Absolutely. Well, I'm someone who is definitely afraid of snakes and I still found a lot of joy in your work. So <laughs> thank you, um, Sean. And I know I, I didn't share the slide of, of your dream registry, but maybe we can talk a little bit more about that during the open-ended conversation too. Sure. Yeah. Um, so with that, I want to uh, move on to Trey, and then we'll open things up a bit. So Trey, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, great. So I'm hoping, um, I know we are having a little bit of audio issues, but hopefully we'll, we'll hold through. I'm going to show some images. I don't know if you can see our screen, but I'm going to show some images of um, your installation. I yeah, I, I just sent you an email with better images. Oh, okay. You guys have Great. lousy images. Oh, this, no. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Okay. Um, uh, well, I mean, it was, it was the, the, the photographer came in and shot it before it was finished, like three days before the show opened. You know? Oh, no. So those are a little more recent. But whatever. Okay. If you can't get them up, no problem. Grow up, the, um, you know, older not good images <laughs> so why don't i so i'm gonna sh i don't have them i didn't get the email yet so why don't i show these images and then what we'll do is share those other images with um everyone via email afterwards does that sound good sure that's fine okay so i'm gonna open these up um but if you want to share a little bit more um, about your, about the installation that you created for the prize, about your just practice overall. Uh, sure. Uh, well, I'm a, I'm an installation artist. Uh, I'm sort of a failed painter and, and, uh, <laughs> turned installation artist, um, or painting, I don't know, painting filled me maybe, I don't know. But it, it was like the rectangle, just, I can't deal with it, you know? And, and I was always interested in what was outside the rectangle, you know, mm -hmm. like that mark on the wall over there was always influ influencing the way that I was trying to see this painting. And mm -hmm. so I just started making more marks on the wall and they came off the wall and got into space. And, um, and <clears throat> so, you know, in a, in a way I'm sort of a Neo cave painter. That's how I sort of see this. I build, I build environments that I light from within, strictly from within, right? So it's a full blackout, uh, like a cave. And um, I don't know, I'm, I, I'm very interested in that. I mean, going back to a little bit of natural history in a sense, I'm uh, very interested in um, the fact that, you know, we made art for 
about 30,000 years before anybody wrote down a word. And, you know, I mean, we were speaking, but nobody was writing for about 30,000 year, years, but we were making art, you know? And I think that says a lot about us as a species. So I'm so interested can, in this kind of like- We construct our reality ahead. based on, no, sorry, we construct our reality, much like Anastasia's work points us in too, is this notion of that we construct our reality based on visual signs and symbols and images, um, right? I mean, that's goes back to Socrates and the allegory of the cave and our reality is very much so based in that kind of visual impetus. Um, so yeah, I, I hear you in that regard, but uh, do it, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. Um, so the work is, you know, but I also have lots of other concerns, obviously. So the, the work is built out of salvage materials, you know, 95 or more percent of it is salvage materials um, from styrofoam to, uh, to neon, to car parts, to basketball hoops, to parasols, um, et cetera. It's all, it's all trash basically. And, uh, <clears throat> so, um, the trash is built into these assemblages throughout the, the room that, that form the, the structure of the installation. And then it's illuminated through three projectors and each of the three projectors projection maps, a certain area of the room and the objects in it. And then those projection maps are animated, et cetera. And the content of those projections um, is based on surveillance, partly live surveillance from within the gallery, partly previously recorded surveillance. Um, some uh, live internet stream surveillance was also mixed in. But ultimately, um, you know, before those, those feeds are uh, spit back out through the projector, they're processed algorithmically. And I, I mask things so that it's, it's, very di it's very difficult to see. It's sort of like, the, the visuals are a camouflage for what they're actually composed of, that, that the content of the visuals is actually uh, surveillance and, you know, and or uh, uh, aspects or methods of surveillance that, that surround um, this concern. So I'm really in this, in this sense, I'm working at the, the crossroads of, of waste culture, right? The, the material content is waste culture and the surveillance state. And, mm -hmm. Obviously, um, you know, there's, there's an underrated connection there going back to underrated connections, like Sean was talking about with uh, art and science, for example, but there's an underrated connection between surveillance and waste culture that isn't talked about very much. And, you know, uh, people don't often link surveillance and waste culture uh, together, or at least I don't hear about that too much. So um, I think it's interesting to explore that because ultimately, you know, all the all this stuff that uh, that's in the trash is stuff that we wanted and that we bought and we got it, right? And then we threw it away. So it's like a perfect negative portrait of, of our desires. This, this like the shadow of our desires. It's what we wanted and what we got and that what we didn't want anymore. And so like mining this area and pulling from this salvage trash is very interesting to me. It has a kind of, um, it has this like this echo of, of our desires that still reverberate in this material. Um, and so I was interested in, in exploring those kinds of reverberations in a sense through sound. And so I invented a couple yeah. of musical for this, for this project. Uh, the one on the right there is called a barp tar. So it's sort of a combination in between a harp and a guitar. So, cause the string, the strings are crossed, they're 15, it's strings on it and they're they're across across one another like a harp um but it sort of looks like a guitar and it's all guitar strings um and i put a b on the front just because that just makes it sound funny or barb tar so harp and guitar and then uh that's run through a multi-channel effects mix mixer and um and it basically sounds like doom you know you can strum it you can play it <laughs> And uh, I, I, uh, it does kind of sound like doom. It does, like, that's a good way of describing it, actually. There's, there's a destabilizing effect when you go into this installation. So I, I did a tour and we spent an hour in your section of the exhibition. Um, we, we visited each person's site each week, um, a different person each week. 
for a different artist each week. And, and so we spent an hour in here and it was very destabilizing. It was very, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean that to be like cruel, but it was, it, I think that's maybe part of your intention, right? Is it's not, uh, we're not escaping into maybe a fantastic utopia here, but more of a dystopia when we enter into this section of the show. And, and I think there's, uh, that's, there's an intentional element there for you correct oh absolutely yeah i mean it it's you know i obviously this this work is concerned with spectacle right like the yeah. spectacle of of the world right and sort of representing that in some sort of retro futurist manner or something like this and um but but then you know you realize if as you're in there that the spectacle is actually composed of you know this this kind of like uh, mindless entertainment and surveillance um, as mapped over trash that, you know, that the elements of this spectacle are um, not what they seemed at first. Like this, this candy doesn't actually taste good. Hmm. Can I ask what your expectations for the viewer are? Like, um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was talking about this with another artist today and we were disagreeing, but um, I, I'm, I'm just going to say what I really think. Like, I don't care yeah. what people, I don't give a damn sure. what people think of my work. I, I, what I do care about are the artists that I think are good, you know, okay. and curators, curators that I think are good, art historians that I think are smart. Like I care, I care what they think, you know, Sure. More, sure. more, more than anybody. Of course, of course, I want everybody to get something out of my work, but at the end of the day, like, like if I, if I, I didn't win the prize, right. But if I won the prize, but you know, Tony Orsler said that my work sucked, like I would be really upset, you know, but if I didn't win the prize and Tony Orsler said, your work is great. I would be much more excited. Sure. Yeah. It's like that. Rigor. Absolutely. I will. So I'm just going to share just a little story about watching visitors interact with your work. And this is anecdotal, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, I was in here and it was after one of my colleagues had given a stroller tour of the museum. And so there were, there were a lot of moms with strollers and babies. <laughs> and um, one of them, one of the moms walked into your, walked into your, your section and I was in there and it's just kind of sitting down and I watched her and she was super excited. She wanted to whip out her phone and kind of like take photos and take selfies and and to me, I think there's kind of an irony there in terms of the commentary you're putting in terms on the spectacle, right? Of um, course. But she's doing that. But the baby lost it and was very, like I could tell was uncomfortable, <laughs> started to wail and started to scream. And I hope you don't take this to be like an insult in a way, but I just thought, how fascinating, right? Like this, may, like in a Lacanian sense, maybe this child <laughs> is able to understand and interpret this work for the, the destabilization <laughs> that's supposed to be embedded there, where the adult is just like so consumed by the spectacle, so uh, 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 taken aback by it, right? And so I, 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 again, I don't mean it to be insulting. I just think it's a really fascinating kind of read. Um, it was an interesting moment for me of watching visitors interact, so. That's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's interesting you bring up Lacan. I've been thinking a lot about the mirror phase in, in regard yeah. to surveillance, but, um, I'm not, I'm not going to dive down that road. Right. No, we don't have to, we don't have to do that right? tonight. But <laughs> I, I thought but I would yeah. share that story. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, I don't, I'm, I'm not offended at all by any reaction that anybody has. I mean, everybody brings themselves to the party. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whatever, whatever reaction somebody has to, to whatever art work is just as much about them as it is about the work. Sure. So, Absolutely. Um, you know, but I'm always I'm always open and happy to hear feedback and credit. I don't get enough criticism, honestly. I'd, I'd love to hear some criticism from you or from the other artists or from the people like that. Yeah, I want to open that. up actually to um, a conversation with some of the other artists and maybe we can kind of talk about all of our work um, or all of your work um, in that process. But uh, so if, if um, Sean and Anastasia, if you want to join us again, um, I have a couple of questions. And then again, if you have questions for the panel, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A feature. 
um, and I'm happy to, to kind of address those. Um, but to get us started, um, and this will lead into another question that I have, I'd really like each of you to comment on what you perceive as maybe the social responsibility of visual artists. Um, I think all of your work is engaging with kind of major social issues, major conditions of contemporaneity, uh, present day condition. And so what are the like ethics maybe that are guiding your practice, um, yourself, your practice? Um, I guess kind of an ethical question overall or a social responsibility question there. Was that to somebody in particular or? Any of you really. Yeah, so I, we can start with any of you. Um, I can say um, I get asked often, um, are you an environmental artist? You know, that's a, a term. I think um, people just love terms, and definitions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then can climate change be stopped with art? No, we can't. Uh, but um, if anything, um, this pandemic showed, it, well, I'll speak for myself personally. Um, I felt, even though I was stuck at home most of the time, home or studio um, or working from home, I felt constantly distracted more than I used to be um, in my usual routine and everyday life. Um, so my point here is if, art can be um, a sort of focused distraction. Um, you know, attention is so finite, right? We only have so much time and attention is so precious. And um, these algorithms, right? Social media and all those screens around can be so creepily accurate in terms of what they send us, you know, what they sort of build for us, this whole infrastructure. Um, so I think actually it's really important to have art be present in physical spaces where it can be experienced, you know, beyond mm. screens. Um, so for that reason, you know, just for the sake of dialogue that art can generate, um, it has, I think it has value in, in that. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's a big part of my own ethics as a museum educator is to, to really get us to question through the arts and to question with these objects. And you're so right, we can't get the same effect. I mean, we're inundated with images all the time, but um, like your work does, it, it really kind of calls upon a poetics um, within the visual arts. So thank you. Uh, 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 Sean, do you wanna jump in or try to answer that question? Yeah, I, I thought that was really great. And I, I can speak to it through, through the panelists' work um, in terms of the way that they, their work makes me think about time. Um, you know, the, the image of the, the kind of the floating alligator that has been, I think it was, I, I, I'm not sure which, where it, where it was, but it was on the Tampa Museum. And it, it I, I think it was a Tampa Museum or someplace, but that image of it in the storefront like that really giant makes me think about Florida going underwater, just that presence of that and the reflections of the planned construction um, mixed with things under construction, mixed with images of things with water reflected into it, makes me think about the past and the present and the future all at the same time. So it's this collapsing, it's this kind of truth of our understanding of where we're at at the moment. And, and also, um, I put it in the chat in terms of the idea of spectacle. Um, you know, usually think of, of spectacle in, in terms of commodity culture, um, you know, go buy this, look at this, look at these bright lights. And the fact that Trey's pulling stuff out of out of junkyards and old signage and then projecting on top of that and making a spectacle of the things that people ignore their responsibility for, um, mm. you know, that interests me. I mean, I don't know if that's completely at all the way he's, they're, they're thinking about it, but it's just an appreciation, you know, from my understanding. And that's, that's kind of what I hope my work is, is doing as well. And the people I'm working with, like um, Chip Lord is one of the contributors to the collection and he did this Miami Beach elegy um, 
um, video that talks about, you know, Miami going underwater. And it's like a, a long kind of meditative video with very little text except for news coverage. And just also the, the fact that the, so many trees get destroyed in the hurricanes, which are caused by the global warming, you know, and, you know, the idea that we're not living, the, it's like trying to create a collection, uh, like, like cabinets used to be built, built on colonialism and kind of commodity and riches. But what I'm trying to do is build kind of one for the present day in the new world we're in, which is a much hotter world and a much more weather intense world filled with pandemics and that, and, and still create a sense of wonder in that, you know, even if it can't solve the problem or be completely activist, I think a big thing is changing people's ideas about what, what, what state we're in right now in a, in a playful way. It has to start there. I think it can't be like activists, like, you know, kind of what Anastasia is talking about, about like environmental art, you know, it has to start or I think with changing people's way of thinking about things. Um, Trey, do you want to comment on that? I thought Sean's read of your work was really beautiful. Yeah, I think that was spot on. Absolutely. Um, I'm definitely influenced by, you know, the situationist and that whole approach. Um, so I, I mean, I don't know. I, I think it's, I think it's kind of bizarre, the idea that like art and society were ever something different from one another. It's, you know, but it, what a kind of ridiculous thing to think. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's always, it's always been that. But isn't way. that the it's, trappings you know, of modernism? We, like that's the, that is kind of the modernist way is that the artist is separate I disagree. from society. I, yeah, I, I well, couldn't disagree more. All right. But modernism, well, modernism, modernism is the white, is, is like the white cube is the perfect example, right? It's, it's okay. an, it's a modernist invention, you know, and in the white cube, what is the white cube for? It's for isolating the art away from the world under right. specialized relighting, right? Under specialized conditions with no distractions, you know, finger quotes over distractions. Right, um, I know, it separates you know, it from it society. It your viewership. And, and so it's, it's, it's abstracted. So it, what I'm talking about is the notion of society being separated from art was, has, it's, always, it's always been connected like it's just we ignored it during modernism. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Sorry. I, I, We're I'll go with the same that. thing. Yeah. And I didn't. No. 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 Yeah. Sorry. I meant that. That's <laughs> the trappings of modernism. This notion that persists today that you know an art art should be separated from society. And of course, it's you're right. It's not in any way. But um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. For clarifying my point. But um, so your own ethics then maybe of of how you approach your practice. Well, I mean, for example, I use almost exclusive, I mean, the tech, the projectors and computers are not, but all, all the material of the exhibition is trash. So, I mean, you know, that, that says a lot right there. I mean, there, there are other installation artists like Tara Donovan, you know, who I, I think are disgusting. I mean, she, she makes huge installations out of like plastic straws with like millions upon millions of plastic straws that she buys to make these installations like that's exactly the opposite of of how i'm thinking about this of course artists have social responsibilities of course we do yeah and you know but how we approach that is a very personal thing you know for some people it's uh you know their art is so much about activism that sometimes it's hard to see the art in it and you know for some people it's more subtle you know so, um, yeah, that's all. <laughs> Any other comments from Sean, Anastasia in response? Okay. I, I do have another question actually that you got at Sean um, in terms of like uh, all of these references to time and, and the present. I think all of you are kind of rooted in a present moment. I think that's a major condition of why you're selected for the prize is this commentary upon um, our current situation, contemporaneity, present day culture, but um, you're doing it all in unique ways, um, but also to end this kind of reaching towards a future, right? There, I, I see a level of utopianism within each of your work, um, this kind of quest for a utopia or 
maybe uh, Trey, I, I see maybe more of a dystopia in, in your work, maybe pushing away from a certain future. Um, and so I, I'm kind of fascinated by that. Like, what is the future that you are envisioning? What is, uh, where do we go from here? Um, and, and maybe this question is just not a good question at all. And you can totally say that, but uh, maybe there's pitfalls in utopian reasoning, but I, I just like to talk a little bit about where do we, what is the future? Where, what does the future look like for each of you? <laughs> my, my, this is gonna maybe be a bummer, but my, my, uh, my actual thoughts about the future are very bleak. Me but too. I <laughs> but I, but I, no, but but it's fine. I think it's fine that it's bleak because um, because I think there's a lot to be done uh, in the present and 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 in in what time there is to respond to these events. I think that artists and scientists in these times it becomes in times like this, it's really important to make sense of what's happening. You know, it's mm -hmm. like to understand it so that so that you know it can be reflected upon and it's not just scary you know that's why i think a sense of play or a sense of humor or or um or a sense of empathy is like really important right now you know like i mean i think that's that's what the work's trying to build so the utopia the utopia is now and the utopia is groups of people working together like like within my projects like the the dream registry is with connie wong and uh jess larson we're working on that and Chip, Chip Lord and um, Leah Floyd and uh, Christina Molina and Kristen Lucas all did videos for this. And then Bethany Taylor did drawings to go inside some of the trunks. So, and then there's a bunch of scientists that, that really help out and, and are, are interested in this too. And so for me, that's a huge thing is people working collectively the same way that I think modernism separated artworks in the white cube, it also separated artists from each other. And I think the art market just does that and the art machine just does that. But for me, it it's always gets really boring if it's just me showing my just my work. You know, it always has mm -hmm. to be kind of like a network. And all the artists that I like the most are people that kind of work in a network together, like Fluxus or um, different art collectives or things like that. So that's that's my utopia is just is just trying to figure all this stuff out in the present and and setting up little areas or little moments in time where people can get, get together and talk within these areas, you know. And we can dream, we can dream together. I think that's a beautiful aspect of your work. Um, this through wonder we do get to kind of build and constantly reimagine what the future might look like. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Trey, you, you and both Sean and Trey, uh, the list of collaborators is very, very long <laughs> in terms of your work. Anastasia, I'd love it if you could share a little uh, about collaboration with your, your own practice too. And um, Well, I'm a photographer. It's a pretty yeah. <laughs> practice. Um, very, you know, you <laughs> on your own with that machine. Uh, but like, I liked what Trey said about sometimes you don't, see the art in the activism and it's, um i noticed that too actually i, res I, 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 I yeah I respond to that statement um I, I, I literally get asked all the time and i said i contributed some prints you know this is where my tangible sort of outlet towards the cause is um mm -hmm. you know they're placed in fundraisers and so on but i'm an artist it's a subjective point of view very um and uh, again, I, I um, sympathize with you both about bleak prospects. Um, I am just about coming out of the trauma of, of Surfside, uh, which is on my block, basically. It's just down the street from me, that building that collapsed. Uh, and I live on Collins Avenue. So the fire trucks here hourly, it was intense, um, you know. Mm -hmm but we have to keep this conversation going, right? Um, you, can't, you can't feel defeated. Um, it's about, you know, and we, even with this project with Flood Zone, it's an ongoing project. Uh, it's meant to mm -hmm. sort of grow. Um, I wish I could have um, zero carbon footprint from my trips, but unfortunately right now the infrastructure is just not there yet. 
So I have mm. to navigate, you know, by car or other means of transportation. Um, but I'm expanding sort of my um, reach um, and the show itself, Flood Zone, um, is, is traveling. Um, it opens here at History of Miami Museum as a big solo exhibition in October. So it's gonna be a whole floor of the museum um, and a, a pretty good selection over, you know, close to 50 photographs and scale really matters for me, scale at which I print. Um, mm -hmm. So seeing them in person, interestingly, interestingly from this show, you know, I had some feedback on my Instagram. It's so great when people understand uh, while that scale matters and how it can be, um, it can sort of transcend you into that dystopian world, uh, which mm -hmm. mine is fairly dark, you know, it's, it's rather sort of, plus I'm Russian, you know, it's rather Tarkovsky, <laughs> the view of things <laughs> in the flood zone. But then it opens in the History of Mary Museum and then at, at the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk in, in Virginia. So that's a whole other flood zone and they're dealing with their issues. And then um, at the end of the year, well, in the, in the, in the spring, it opens in um, uh, Eastman Museum. So that's Rochester and Buffalo, New York in New York. Um, they just announced, they just sort of um, self-proclaimed to be the capital for climate migration. Mm. Uh, so it, that area is removed from any sort of flooding, but they're going to have this inflow of um, climate migrants, essentially, something like mm. we're experiencing right now with Orlando, actually, from South Florida, and then Atlanta, for instance. So I can go on and on. Um, it's quite layered. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's so it's so exciting about all the exhibitions that you have coming coming up. I do think you know maybe I can challenge you a little bit. I think even though your work is subjective in terms of being a singular artist, I think you're also engaging in, in conversations with other researchers, and maybe your research process is reliant, of course, upon um, interdisciplinary connections as well, and, and yeah. in much the way that Sean is. So. Um, yeah. Anyway, I just, I was thinking about that. Yeah, you actually years, just but... reminded me, I need to point out, if anybody has any flooding stories, to reach out to me, please. And then History of Man Museum <laughs> is going to have a whole room of, <laughs> please, Floridians, a whole room of people <laughs> reporting Floridians, their yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and then I'm walking around with my camera, and sometimes I get lost, which is a proper way to do photography. I get really lost and find myself in just unusual neighborhoods, and I get asked often what I'm doing. And so all I need yeah. to say is I'm, I'm shooting this project called Flood Zone. And then people say, let me tell you, okay, listen, <laughs> this is story. my garage floated away. And I'm just a terrible reporter. I'm a, a good photographer, but I can't write things down in time, you know? So we're going to have this interactive uh, component. <laughs> oh, it's a little dark. <laughs> it's a little sad. Oh, I'm so <laughs> Trey, can you, can you lighten the mood a little bit? Do you have a brighter outlook for the future and humanity? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Trey, are you still there? All right, there we go. I think we're yeah. doomed. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, go ahead. You know, but that's, I mean, it's kind of funny. You know, it's, I don't know. I, I try to... <laughs> I try to keep a sense of humor about it, but yeah, I think we're, I think we're completely doomed. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe so, that is sorry. the like pitfall <laughs> of utopian thinking though, right? Is to be constantly thinking about the future. We kind of forget about the conditions of our present um, and the ways that we can make small changes now to make our lives better. Maybe we should just be focused on our day-to-day -day living. And maybe that's an ethics in and of itself. I'm not sure if we need to constantly be looking towards the future. Does that make sense? I don't know. <laughs> uh, sure um, it does. I mean, you, the classical root of utopia from the Greek, it, it means nowhere. That's what the word means. So, you know, it, that, that says everything I need to know. I mean, uh, I mean, it's, it's great to have dreams, I suppose, you know, but, uh, I don't, I don't see any utopia happening anytime soon, at least not for most people. Well, yeah. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, we do have, well, let's see, just a few um, 
comments and and I, I'm seeing some great comments from the audience in terms of your work, all of your work resonating. Um, Babs did say though, uh, Trey, that uh, that she she liked a little bit more organized chaos. Um, in terms of installation works, but uh, that all of the work again resonates in, in important ways and congratulations to all of you. Um, and I thought this is a really beautiful kind of closing comment from Catherine Burrell. Um, uh, I tell my kids to look to artists to know the truth of a society um, and what a poignant statement that is. So thank you all for being truth tellers, for sharing your talent, um, for sharing your time with us this evening. Fortunately, again, the, clo the show is closed, um, but this uh, panel discussion and the past two panel discussions have been recorded. So I encourage you, if you haven't taken a look at those, uh, to engage with those as well. So thank you so much. And I hope everybody has a great evening. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.